Hi, welcome back to this mini video series where I build a uh, financial spreadsheet that will hopefully help you understand the prospects of your investments better or your financial circumstances better. Uh, please watch this um, video series from the beginning where I start with a completely frank uh, spreadsheet. Uh, this video is a continuation of two previous videos, one where I build up um, a pretty simple model that uh, illustrated what you could reasonably expect to make from a continued series of investments into the equity markets, how that added up and accumulated over time. And the second one, where I added the minimal risk asset, as most people shouldn't just be buying uh, equities for their investments. In this video, I'll be adding the idea of uh, risk of the equity investments. Uh, so while we have a reasonable expectation of the returns from the equity markets, um, we should also understand that those uh, returns can be very, very volatile. Uh, we need to know what that looks like, even if the assumptions we have to make can be challenged. Um, but we need to think about that um, uh, for our personal circumstances and how, uh, how it impacts how, how the portfolio choices we make. The advantage of these spreadsheets is that it'll hopefully enable you to understand how all these numbers fit together better and you can tailor the assumptions or even the model to your uh, specific circumstances. Um, my name is Lars Croyer. I'm a former hedge fund manager who has written a couple of books about finance and I'm now doing these videos as a hobby. I'm not a financial advisor, so before you do anything I say here or in any other video, um, please do your own work or take your own advice. But um, let's get back to the spreadsheet. So we're back to the model where we finished before and like in the last video, I'm going to start by copying the sheet. So we start with a fresh sheet. Um, and there we go. And I'm going to rename this uh, adding risk. So we're the same exact same model. Um, uh, and again, what you can appreciate, and I'll keep emphasizing this at the start of every video, how far we are getting with a, a couple of relatively simple assumptions on contribution and on return and time horizon and allocation. Of course, this is exactly the point is we, with, with very simple assumptions, we can keep getting more and more out of this model. So in this uh, segment, we're adding risk. Um, it's called standard deviation. Um, let's just copy these numbers down. We call this zero and 25. Just very briefly, it's obviously a gross simplification to have the minimal risk asset have, have zero risk, and it's it's not a reflection of real life. Um, the reason I do it is to keep the model symbol, and also because otherwise we would be needing to introduce correlation between the minimal risk asset and equities. Correlation is a measure of how they move relative to each other. Um, and, and that itself is a changing number. Besides, the minimal risk asset is really very, very low risk. Imagine you have a 10-year U.S. government bond. As long as you can handle the interim fluctuations in value, there is really very little risk that you don't get repaid what you think you're going to get repaid um, at the end. Particularly, you can even do this inflation protected. Um, so that's the risk. Um, let me... Um, in, in equities, if again there is a, the the equity market volatility itself moves around a lot, right? Now you can look at something called the VIX, which currently has an estimated risk um, volatility, albeit short term, of fifteen percent. I'll just uh, get to why we're not uh, using such a low number. Let me copy in a normal distribution curve. Copy image, paste image. I'm going to put this up here. Um, so what you see is this is a normal distribution curve. And, and um, for those of you that don't know this kind of stuff, please Google it. It's essentially saying that in 1%, uh, minus 1% to 1% of the standard deviation, um, the 68% of the cases, so 68% of the years should fall between that. Minus 2 to plus 2 is 95%. And minus 3 to plus 3 is 99.7%. So let's go back to the example where I said you had a 15% standard deviation in the market and a mean of 5. Uh, let's say we had a 3% standard deviation move. So that's obviously, oh, sorry, 3 standard deviation move. So that's 3 times 15 is obviously 45. 
Oh, I'm such a sorry. I'm such a stickler for formatting. Um, and let's say it's relative to the mean of five percent. So it would be five percent, and then you had a three percent standard deviation move. So this is essentially saying that a negative forty percent move in the market is a forty percent loss. And what the normal distribution curve is saying that that should happen nine well one minus. 99.7%, so that's 0.3%, but only half of that because half the cases would be in the positive territory. So essentially it's saying that in 0.15% of the cases, so that's about every 700 years, we should have a negative 40% move in the stock markets or worse. Now we all know that this is something that happens in reality every couple of decades, although obviously that is self varies. But this is the concept of fat tails that very bad and unlikely bad events happen in the stock market more than suggested by the normal distribution function. It's a big issue in um, sort of uh, the academic circles in finance. But essentially, man, this curve goes out, sort of higher up out here. That's essentially what it is. So gross simplification, that's why I'm using 25%, which is higher than the current markets. Again, it's in the interest of getting this model working. My former professors would undoubtedly recoil, recoil with embarrassment and disown me if they uh, saw me doing this kind of stuff on the internet, but, but so be it. Now let's uh, get into the model and let me copy this down. So the actual risk, uh, just up so we can see it. So let's say that what is the return once you include the risk? The minimal risk return is no risk. So that's the same area as so if this recalculates. And in the equities, we're gonna use a random, this is the key part of this video. So we're gonna use a random function um, in, within the normal distribution curve. So think of it that all the cases happen underneath this curve. So that's 100% of the cases are here. So we want to pick a number between 0 and 1 and make that number be random to reflect the randomness of the equity returns in any one year. Let me see if I can do this right. So that would be normal inverse normal curve. Uh, this one. Oh, shit. Um, uh, norm uh, inverse this one, reason, and then it's going to be a random function, uh, function um, between zero and one. That's what it defaults to, with a mean of the expected return of the equity markets and a standard deviation of twenty-five percent. And there you go. So you see how that, in this case, spat out seventeen point one percent. So this is essentially saying in that year you were lucky. The re equities returned seventeen point one percent. And that's because we assumed that equities had a mean return of 5 and a standard deviation of 25%. So let's recalculate and you'll see how it changes every year. So this is sort of like real life um, scenarios. Now let's make this a constant just so we can copy the formula down. And what you see now, we copy the formula down and we recalculate it. So this is all the different returns in the different years. Let's go to the investment return, which is now no longer a constant, but uh, well, in the case of the minimal risk, it's the same. Um, and in the case of equity, it changes every year. So there you go. So that's that. Copy that down and recalculate that. And here you have it. Now you see that the investment return has changed every year. And the net number we end up with at 67 is now going to change. See how volatile it is. This is essentially saying the randomness of the market uh, is such that you can be really lucky or really unlucky. Um, those that are inclined to do more complex math, you, if you want a multi-year standard deviation, it's the square root of the time. The reason I don't do that here is it gets quite messy to sort of outline an Excel spreadsheet particularly as you do annual contributions that, um, that themselves change. Um, so so this, is, this, is, uh, this is the reason we do that. Uh, by the way, we're also assuming that the years here are uncorrelated relative to each other, which I don't think is a terrible assumption. Um, but generally be aware, a lot of people can shoot a lot of the stuff I'm doing down with sort of uh, financial academics, but, uh, but I think overall it's, it's, it's pretty okay. Now what you see is you change the calculations again and it's very volatile. In the next videos we're going to run multiple scenarios so we can see 
say, you know, see how this would work if you ran this model many, many times, um, which should give us a good idea of, um, um, uh, of, of, of uh, how you can plan ahead some multiple scenarios. We're also going to see how you can change the allocations from year to year, change the contribution from year to year. This hasn't changed in this video. Um, but uh, uh, please do comment if there's stuff you want me to add. And, and and I'll try to add it um, add it in the in the next videos and um, but but for now just keep in mind we've created a, a fairly complex model with risk of the equity markets and we can see how that risk spits out different um, returns um, every time we rerun the model and and uh, we're going to be able to make quite robust general statements on the basis of this in, in the coming videos. So thanks for watching. I hope that was interesting and useful. In the next video, we'll be continuing with the model and add multiple scenarios to the risk we've just added. Um, you can subscribe to my channel if you want to hear of that or future videos I, I put up. Um, or you can share the video on social media if you think your friends would benefit from watching it. But in any case, I hope to see you in the next video.